little on me. This is book number seven, Message Not Received. I rail against email and jargon. I think that there are better ways to communicate. Before I started writing and speaking, I spent about, oh gosh, a decade inside organizations implementing different systems, so I've been called a technology expert. Um, these days I do public speaking and some writing, and as I will talk about in a bit, I am a recovering email addict. This is the last stop on my book tour. Last week I was in Austin, Texas for a bunch of places, and then I was in Seattle before then, and when I decided to wrap this one up at Zappos, is one here last time, water blue notwithstanding, I thought it was particularly an important topic because of the changes you guys are going through. I'm no expert on self-management or teal organizations, but I don't have to tell you that this goes away. And you communicate with each other in a very different way. You don't necessarily do something because your boss says you have to, you do it because you want to or because it's a decent project to work on. So keep that in mind as I go through some of the tips for communicating better. And in putting together these talks, I thought it was really important for me early on to talk a little bit about my own communication style and journey. I used to not be very good at communicating. In fact, it used to be a liability for me. I've gotten my ass kicked a few times on performance reviews because I didn't communicate particularly well. And even to this day, even though I like to think a fairly decent communicator, after all, I write and speak for a living, to this day, I'm not omniscient. There's plenty that I don't know about communication, about language, about business, about technology. And I'm not Dale Carnegie. I'm not the world's best communicator. Sometimes people don't understand me. And sometimes I don't understand other people. And finally, I'm not the arbiter of what is or what is not jargon. And when I think about definitions, I always go back to a 1964 Supreme Court ruling. Justice Potter Stewart famously was ruling on the definition of pornography. Bet you didn't think I was going to talk about porn five minutes in. Did you? <laughs> I said, well, what is it? And he said, I don't know, but I know it when I see it. So when I hear jargon, I can't say that there's this definitive list of words that are always jargon and are never jargon. But I think we've all seen people who sort of bloviate and try to make others feel inferior and make themselves feel smart. And my previous books have been about platforms, about big data, about data visualization, IT projects. And as I thought about book number seven, the natural arc for me was to go with the Internet of Things. I think it's absolutely fascinating. But I stopped, and I realized that all this data and technology don't mean a hill of beans unless we communicate well with each other. And unfortunately, we usually don't at work. I decided to go on a mission to simplify business communication. Now, as Chris and other people who've known me for more than five minutes will attest, I am a big fan of quotes. I've already quoted a 1964 obscure Supreme Court ruling. And one of my favorites is from Jerry Seinfeld, who said, we never should have put a man on the moon. And why? Because now we can say, we could put a man on the moon, but we can't communicate well at work, or we can't do something really simple. When I think about communication at work and why it so often fails us, I am hopeful because, in my opinion, the solution is within our reach. We have to do two things better. Use less email and use less jargon. And when I thought about the title for this book, I was very taken by this particular quote. Anyone know who said this? No Googling. <laughs> You're not allowed to answer, Joe. Okay. This is George Bernard Shaw, the London or I'm sorry, Irish playwright and co-founder of the London School of Economics, said that the single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that's taken place. And I think that that's the key problem here. It's not that we're knowingly unclear, and you realize it, right? Oh, sure, I'm unclear all the time. We're unaware of the fact that others aren't receiving our messages. And to me, that's the biggest problem. Okay, book giveaway number one. I want the characters, not the TV show. Who are these guys? Yes? Give them a book. Walter White and Jesse Pinkman from the show Breaking Bad, my favorite show. I'm sure I'll mention it again at some point today. So business communication is fundamentally broken. Again, we send way too much email and we use too much jargon. Now, I'm a data guy. I enjoy numbers. And I'm very curious. I want you to think, Chris mentioned when he woke up in the morning, there are 300 messages in his inbox. That might be extreme, but I bet you it's not totally uncommon. I'd like you to think about the last time you took a proper vacation. 
And when you returned, how many unread messages were in your inbox? Just think about that for a moment. And I'm curious. I'd like everyone to just stand up for a second. And I want to figure out who has the most emails. Go ahead and have a seat if the last time you came back from vacation, there were fewer than 25 unread messages in your inbox. I didn't think anyone would be sitting. How about 50? 50 or under? No one, huh? How about 100? Under 100? Okay. How about 200? Anywhere under 200? Some of you are still standing. Was it more than 500? If so, have a seat. Some of you are still standing. More than 500? I'm afraid to ask. Was it more than 1,000? Okay. So, so more than 1,000 messages. If you took one minute to read and respond to those messages, assuming you didn't get any, else, any more emails that day, that would be 1,000 minutes, which is, how's my math, 16 hours and 40 minutes of doing nothing else than responding to emails when you should have been on vacation. I came across this company recently. I think they were in Germany or France. But they configured their email servers to respond with the following message once an employee indicated that he or she was on vacation. Your email has been deleted. If it's really important, send it again on insert date. That employee comes back. I would love to see that. Right? In fact, a buddy of mine that used to work at Google, now he works at Pinterest, was telling me that a Google engineer just configured his auto out of office response message to do the same thing. I'm going to delete your email. You'll have to send it again. So email seems to be this big problem. But as I was researching the book and observing people in my day-to-day -day life, I realized that the problem wasn't email. The problem was how we used it. In 2012, I wrote a piece for Inc.com about my email addiction. And my initial reaction was to find some sort of Gmail extension, right? There's got to be a, uh, some new tchotchke out there that helps me manage my email better. And I played around with Write Inbox and Boomerang and all sorts of different bells and whistles, but I ultimately realized that the answer was more human. In other words, the problem isn't email. The problem is how we use it. Now, that's not to say that I'm against email. I remember getting my first personal email in 1991. I was a sophomore at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And I got an electronic message, and it blew my mind because my friends and I used to print out letters and mail them to each other. That's how we stayed in touch. And the fact that I didn't have to do that, I couldn't even grasp. And if you think now, in the vast majority of organizations, email is the default means of communication. Why? Because email actually works. It fulfills a legitimate business need. In other words, it's ubiquitous. When was the last time you went to a conference or a networking event or job interview and you, someone gave you a business card, and it did not contain an email address. I bet you it's never happened. So email is ubiquitous. In the book, I talk about network effects. This is why Facebook's trying to connect the world. Imagine if you can get in touch with everyone in the world through one network. It's incredibly powerful. Email is also convenient. In the late 1990s, when I was working as a software consultant, if you wanted to send email, you had to be in a proper office or you could take your laptop out and connect through a virtual private network or VPN. Anyone have to do that these days? No, you whip out this thing and you can easily check your email, right? You're online at the supermarket, you're at the gym, you're waiting at the traffic light, you're driving, which you really shouldn't do. So email is incredibly convenient. We would send fewer emails if we had to go into the office or if we even had to go upstairs. It's also incredibly cheap. I would love, if I took a job in a corporate world, to charge people one penny per email tax. And at the end of the month, let's say you had a deduction for $20. You go, $20, what's up with this? Well, you sent 2,000 emails. So one penny wouldn't stop you from doing it if it's, a, if it's an important email, but it's enough to make you notice. Anytime there's a cost with something, you're going to think about it. It's also incredibly fast. What do most people here use? Microsoft Outlook? Okay. So what do you hit, F9 or F5, and boom, you don't even have to hit the check and receive. So these emails aren't instantaneous, but they're pr pretty close. If emails took 10 or 15 minutes to reach their recipients, I guarantee some of you, in some cases, would send a fax, because it absolutely positively needs to be there sooner than that. It's also very reliable. Right? Very rarely is there a glitch in the matrix. It's funny, a buddy of mine recently um, 
remarked, and he was dead on here, that my book has angered the email gods. Because I had sent a note to some of my friends saying, you know, hey, haven't you got my email? Or I'm not getting your emails. Or clients had said, where's your invoice, man? Turns out I had a problem with Google Apps. They were incorrectly marking things as spam. Now, that doesn't change the fact that of the probably 2.3 million emails I've sent in my life, and I actually figured that out in the book, give or take, probably 99.99% of them have actually gone through successfully. So I guess my book has ticked off somebody. <laughs> but it's very reliable. It's also very secure. Some of you may be thinking, well, what about that Sony hack recently, right? Again, that's the exception that proves the rule. We have all hit reply all when we meant to just hit reply to the person, right? It's happened to everyone, myself included, and we've eaten some crow for doing it. But for the most part, email is very secure. And perhaps best of all, email is what they call asynchronous. And that is just a fancy word for saying, if I want to email Chris about having lunch next week, I can do it at 2 in the morning when I'm up for some reason. But Chris doesn't have to answer it. He can answer it a two days or a week later when it's convenient for him. Forget about voicemail for a minute. Telephone doesn't work that way. If you want to have a conversation, you actually need to be talking at the same time. It's a synchronous form of communication. So I understand why we send so many emails, but we've gone way too far. Is anyone here a Dilbert fan? Yeah, this is one of my favorites. So we think we're being clear when we communicate, but many times we're not. I'm going to go into some data, some statistics, some research a little bit later in the talk. But again, the problem isn't email, the problem is how we use it. I like to say, blame the Indian, not the arrow. No one forces us to send inscrutable emails or to reply to all with 75 people and create a mess, create a misunderstanding. Next book giveaway. What movie is this? Who said it? Yeah, he's right. I, I don't know which person, but yeah, Caddyshack. Speak up or forever lose your book. <laughs> so I golf, not particularly well, and occasionally I get mad at my seven iron. But my seven iron didn't slice itself. I did because I swung it. Right? Now, I'm talking a lot about email and how we use it too frequently, which begs the question, how much of our professional lives do we spend sending and receiving emails? Anyone want to take a guess? What percentage? Louder. Yeah, that's close enough. Here you go. It's actually around 28%, but we'll take 30. 30% of your day is sending and receiving emails. In some cases, that turns out to be around three or four hours a day every day. Now, that might seem like a big number to you because you're probably not checking email only once in a day or twice, or five times, or maybe even 10 times. So let's do some math. You don't get a giveaway for this one. This one's too obvious. This equation isn't going to make any sense to you, but I'm going to explain it. Let's say that you receive 150 emails in a day. Right? It's actually a fairly common number. And you spend just a minute sending and receiving. That turns out to about 150 minutes or two and a half hours in a day which is, when you think about it, about one quarter of your day. Now, let's say that you're comfortable with that number. That's the way that people communicate. I was watching the premiere of the final seven seasons of Mad Men last night. Anyone catch that? Yeah. No one communicates like that anymore. No one types things out. No one uses intra-office memos. I remember when they were around, but I'm dating myself. That's just how people communicate. But this number is rising at about 15% a year. In other words, if you only receive 100 emails in a day, only, by 2020, you can expect to receive twice that number. Unless you can figure out how to put more hours in a day, something has to give. It's statistics like these that have led Nick Bilton to say that email is probably the most invasive form of communication ever devised. Bilton is a very good writer. He writes for the New York Times, and he wrote the excellent book, Hatching Twitter. Anyone ever read that book? Excellent. Uh, very dysfunctional culture. I'm amazed that they can keep the lights on. It's such a compelling read that they're turning it into a movie. So what, right? We send a lot of email. Big deal, right? How does this impact the bottom line? On the book, I argue that relying so ex 
extensively on email is actually bad business. How bad? How about $1 trillion a year bad? And that's the number that McKinsey came up with their Global Institute study in 2012. Now that's a really big number. Let me put it into, give you some context for it. Anyone know Uber's current valuation? 40 billion. Ah, give him a book. What the heck? That's 25 Ubers worth of inefficiency because of email. The US gross domestic product GDP in 2012 was 15.4 trillion. So you're talking about a 6 to 7% savings minimum if we just can wean people off of email. Now that's a huge number. It's very difficult to conceptualize. But there are many problems that stem from our inability to actually communicate, from our over-reliance on email. I spoke about a month ago in San Jose, California at a company. And I said, well, can you tell me about a particular instance in which email caused misunderstanding or prevented a problem from being solved? And the leaders of this company told me about a data problem that took two years to resolve. Two years. Now, in my career, I've spent a lot of time on data problems. Some of them hurt my brain. Never two years. Remember what Seinfeld said, we can put a man on the moon, but it takes us two years to solve a data problem? He said, tell me more about the problem. Well, the San Jose office and the UK office just kept emailing each other back and forth. When they finally got together in person, that email problem, um, that data problem, excuse me, really wasn't so complicated. It underscores the need for in-person in communication. By the way, what movie is this? In my book. Pacino De Niro, if you haven't seen it, check it out. Fantastic movie. So if email is so toxic for collaboration, if it's so fundamentally inefficient, why do we insist on using it so frequently? Why can't we get off the email chain? Well, as I said before, the answer for the most part is human, not technological. We choose the tools that we use. We love to blame technology, right? Because technology can't blame us back. Oh, that email application or that PowerPoint. You know what? You can create, I like to think, a decent PowerPoint presentation. You just can't put 62 bullets in there and a bunch of figures that no one can see. This is not 1998. Scores of more powerful communication tools exist. It's amazing to me how back in the late 90s, you saw these nascent internets and knowledge bases, but they weren't very good, and you couldn't try them out because there was no cloud computing or software as a service, at least as we know them today. These days, it's very easy to play around with a tool, see if it works, it takes root in an organization, maybe through the freemium model, then perhaps you buy more features or more licenses. So it's not 1998. There are very powerful tools out there that effectively mimic social networks. The learning curve on, the, on these applications is very short because you're used to using Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter or something else. So they resemble email in the sense that you're inputting information, but they already ship with things like at symbols or hashtags. The search is much, much better. Yet we can't get off the email train. Why? Well, at a high level, we're just used to it. If you send 100 emails in a day, 500 in a week, let's give you, what, four weeks vacation? How's my math? 24,000 emails in a year? If you do something 24,000 times in a year, you're going to get really good at it. You're going to get used to it. Email is just official. This is how companies announce things these days, right? There's something fundamentally official about email. And email also has a CYA, cover your ass component to it. I can go out to, Chris, to lunch with Chris and say, I don't like this new person we're hiring, and I have these concerns that he's exactly the wrong person for the job. And Chris says, yeah, you're probably right. And six months from now, it's been known to happen, I was actually right. And I go back and say, Chris, I told you so. Well, here's the problem. Chris doesn't remember it, or Chris remembers it differently, or Chris, I won't say got hit by a bus, but won the lottery and doesn't work here anymore, although they don't have the lottery in this state, but you get my point. So there's something fundamentally official about it, and we've all done it, myself included, right? We've all said, I sent this email on such and such a date, right? It's like that scene in The Big Lebowski. Is this your homework, Larry? Who's with me on that? You got that one? A little obscure, but you know with this sticker on here, I gotta at least throw in one Big Lebowski reference. And thanks to smartphones, email is everywhere. Again, we just whip these things out, 
play whack-a-mole with our email so when we come back from vacation, we don't have a thousand emails sitting in our inbox. It's become so easy and so convenient that it's tough for us to get off of it. Many of us have a fear of personal interaction. I know there's this uh, stereotype of Milton, the squirrely IT guy in office space. Who's with me on that? Okay, very true. I was promised I could listen to my radio at a reasonable volume. (laughs) This is true with IT people sometimes, but think about it. If I say something to you, I can't just take it back. But with an email, and I've done this as well, I've, for certain emails on consulting projects, going live, very political, high visibility, I've spent an hour on an individual email. I joke that even though I've written seven books, I've probably written another seven if you take just a lot of my emails I've, I've put together. Some of us secretly crave email even though we complain about it. Imagine if you went to vacation and there weren't any emails for you. Wouldn't you feel, you know what? People are either really respectful of my time or I'm not that important. Right? How many of us, it's happened to me, have been irritated when you found out that an email was sent and you weren't copied on it and you should have been? It happens to everyone. It's very natural. We like to be busy. In the book, I write about this uh, sort of fictitious continuum. On one end, you're completely overwhelmed at work. You have no time to do anything. Emails, bang, bang, bang. On the other end, you're totally bored. And at any point, you feel like you can be laid off. You have balance in your life, but you don't feel too secure. At least when you're busy, you feel like you've got some kind of job security. Cultural norms. Many organizations don't know that there is another way of communicate. I have walked into organizations and spoken very clearly, I think, and people said, who taught you how to speak? Because people would mimic the jargon from senior levels. Has anyone ever seen the movie or read the book Smartest Guys in the Room? It's about the collapse of Enron, a company that at one point was worth $70 billion, but it was all based on creative accounting, to put it politely. And people would go up to the CEO and they'd have conversations and he'd say, can, can we do this? The CEO, right? Um, Jeff Skilling, are we allowed to do this? And some people would say, I don't know, it seems kind of risky. And eventually someone would go, yeah, I, I think that, that's legal. That falls within the generally um, accepted accounting principles. Well, guess what? Skilling would like the people who confirmed what he said. It's called confirmation bias. So in many organizations, you're not allowed to call bullshit if someone's using a bunch of jargon, right? Organizations are not democracies for the most part. Some people are unaware that there are new tools. I was at a conference in New York last year, and there were about 40 thought leaders, for lack of a better term. And I remember one woman's comment. Employees would love to be more productive if the tools only existed. I said, you've got to be kidding me, right? Atlassian, Slack, Yammer, Jive, on and on, the entire table in the book full of not necessarily replacements for emails, but at the very least, complements or supplements to emails. In reality, many of us are lazy. We don't want to learn new tools. If we send 20,000 emails in a year, we're going to be good at it. And even though these tools, these enterprise social networks, or whatever you want to call them, are incredibly intuitive, in my opinion, some of us just don't like to learn. I read a story about three months ago after the book had been finalized, but it hadn't been printed yet, about a leader at a company who was probably 52, 53 years old. And he refused to use whatever the collaborative tool was. And they kept telling him there, it was a younger company, we really need this stuff. We don't know the status of our project. We don't know all the knowledge that's in the organization. If you keep using it in email, we need it in this new tool. The guy just said, I don't do them. They wound up letting him go. And then finally, in many instances, we like to blame the IT department, right? Oh, IT just doesn't give us what we need. Sometimes that may be true, but as someone who spent a lot of time in software demos with clients and prospective clients, The first question I hear is typically, can I export that data into Excel? Now, I'm not against Excel. Excel is incredibly useful. I'm really good at Excel. But if you're the IT department and you have a small budget and you've got security threats and other things you need to do, why would you spend the time and resources giving people a tool that they're ultimately not going to use? Email can cause confusion and misunderstanding in organizations and even among people who've only known each other for, oh, I don't know, three decades. You get a book and a t-shirt if you get this one. This is a bonus one. Anyone know who these guys are? Very obscure. Okay. This is one of my favorite bands. They're called Marillion, 
and they're based in the UK. They've released 19 studio albums over three decades. Uh, they fall into the genre of progressive rock. Um, I'm actually going to see them in a few weeks in Montreal. And they've played thousands of shows together. These guys know each other really, really well. And because I write for some media outlets like Huffington Post, I got to interview some of the members of the band. And about three, four months ago, I was able to talk to Mark Kelly, who's the band's keyboardist. So we're there to talk about the new album and what the band's doing, the tour, and you know, I got to geek out. But he said, stop, you're working on a new book, right? And I said, yeah, you know, it's pretty much finished. He said, and you're against email, right? I go, well, not against it, but I don't think that we should rely on it as our primary communication tool. Said, Interesting, he said, my wife runs a PR firm over in the UK, and she's constantly complaining about how people are sending her email all the time. I said, oh, I, I guess that's a real problem. He said, you don't know the half of it. He told me the story about how a couple months ago, the guy at the other end of the picture, the drummer, Ian Mosley, kind of irritated the band with an email. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, we sent this email and we, we called him up and said, hey, Ian, you know, you seem really upset. He goes, oh, I'm not upset at all. But because of his email, people thought that he was. So think about it. If a band that's been together for over 30 years spent thousands of nights together playing shows can misunderstand each other, over email, what does that say for a company of 300 or 3,000? And what if a lot of those new hires don't understand the culture yet? Now, that's a single story, but it's only a single data point. Let's look at some data. And in 2006, a couple of researchers looked at the question, are people being clear in their communication? 80% of the people asked said that they were being clear regardless of whether they were speaking or writing, whether that's text or email. I'm actually surprised that it's that low. I don't meet one in five people who will cop to not being clear, but whatever, let's go with their 80%. And the results were mixed. 75% of the time, listeners picked up on tone, on sarcasm, on whether or not you're being serious. Okay, so three out of four times. Not great, but you know, better than flip of the coin. Only 56% of the time, though, did those same recipients fully understand the messages when they were written. Okay. But it gets worse. That's not the worst part of the study. Most of the senders had no idea that their messages weren't being received. This means that text-based communication offers the illusion of clarity. We think that when we're texting, we're being clear with each other because it sort of resembles real-time communication. It's got some characteristics, but it there's a lot of subtext that often falls between the cracks. I didn't want to put it in here because there's a lot of profanity, but if you haven't seen it, check out the Key and Peel skit on text messaging. I can't do it justice here, but let's just say that two people are texting each other and they get a very different message. And there may be a few F-bombs in there as well. So what are the other effects of excessive email? Here's where it gets to be fun. If you Show up to work not having slept the night before, your IQ drops by 10 points, okay? Big deal. There's no context for that stat. I'm about to give you some. If you show up to work high, your IQ drops by four points. By the way, the dude. We already went there with the big Lebowski. I gotta, gotta be fair to my other favorite movies and TV shows. I don't wanna overdo it there. Now on Netflix, by the way. Constantly checking email, 10 points. In other words, you're better off showing up at work high <laughs> than you are constantly checking email. <laughs> Other effects, we become confused and overwhelmed. I've got some more data to show you in a bit, but most people can't take any more information. Right? There is a limit to how much information we can process. It doesn't mean that we're not intelligent, it means that we're human. We also make it nearly impossible to find key information. Interesting stat, Google, last time I checked, indexes, ready for this, 30 trillion web pages. It's a ridiculous number. Yet, when we Google things, right, typically, and I'm gonna show some more data on this in a second, we can find precisely what we want in, oh, I don't know, 0.2 seconds. Now, I'm willing to bet that no one in here has anywhere near <laughs> even 30 million messages in your inbox. Yet sometimes we can't find what we need. 
It's happened to every one of us. And we use date ranges. We search by the sender, whether it was Chris, or we use keywords or negative keywords. We use folders and we use tags. But sometimes, damn it, we can't find that key email. And we're not even talking about anywhere near 30 trillion. That's not to say that email search hasn't improved. It has quite a bit. But it certainly isn't perfect, certainly in comparison to web-based search. We also irritate prospective customers and partners. Everyone's heard of constant contact, right? If you haven't, I'll bet you a Coke that at some point you've received an email message with constant contact in the footer. Now, the number one reason from constant contacts research that people unsubscribe to email chains or letters, subscriptions, is guess what? They send me too many emails. It's also the same reason that people unlike a page from Facebook. You're communicating with me too much. You're overwhelming me. We also lose focus. This is some more fun data for you. In 2000, the average American's attention span was a full 13 seconds, and this comes from the National Center for Biotechnology Information. Big deal, right? No context for that. Here's where it gets fun. That number dropped to eight seconds in 2013. Okay, what's your point? The average goldfish can pay attention for nine <laughs> seconds at a time. Yes, we are trailing the goldfish. So if you're showing up to work and you're constantly checking email, you are not being nearly as productive as you think. And you might think, oh, I'm multitasking. No, you're not. You're multi-changing. And it takes you five times as long to go back to focusing on what you were doing than before. Now, if I could eliminate superfluous or urgent emails, if I could change the way that people actually type stuff in, would I fix what's wrong with business communication? It'd be a good start, but the answer is no. Far too many of us rely on jargon. And I've got some great examples in here. I may not be the arbiter of jargon, but I've seen a lot of it in my career, such as omni-channel engagement mapping. This ought to be in everyone's desk in corporate America. No less authority than Einstein emphasized the need for people to be simple. And you might say, well, I work with technology, and technology is complicated. Maybe. I wrote a book about big data a couple years ago, and I've explained it to a teenager. Now, did I do it by talking about distributed file systems, parallel processing, fault tolerance, and petabytes of unstructured data? No. I did it by talking about YouTube and Facebook and Twitter. Is there more to it than that? Of course there is, but people forget their audiences. And these days, jargon permeates the business world. It's always been around, but I'm going to argue today that it's actually exacerbated over the last five to ten years. Here are just a few of my personal pet peeves. I've never understood why it's price point and not price. If someone can explain that to me, I'd actually like to hear it. Now, let's look at some examples. And I'll do a book giveaway for this one. Which company's mission statement was this? I'll give you a clue. The color should tip you off. I don't know who said it first. Uh, it is Twitter, yeah. This was Twitter's mission statement, I'm sorry, vision statement, on November 12, 2014 from Div Costello. 220 characters. Does anyone appreciate the irony of that number? <laughs> Twitter couldn't even tweet its own vision statement because the maximum, as you know, is 140 characters. Right? Now, Twitter isn't some cute startup. Right? It's a $30 billion force with a very rich multiple. It helps if you can communicate to your investors kind of what you're all about. Right? But I wasn't the only one to pick up on this. Dennis K. Berman tweeted, he's the Wall Street Bur um, Biz Journal's business editor, about 35 words, 62 syllables, four clauses, and two grammatical errors. <laughs> so even Twitter, a company that prides itself on brevity, can't be relatively brief in explaining what it's trying to do. Here is a recent software vendor's press release from um, CSC, Computer Science Corporation. This monstrosity of a sentence contains 61 words and 380 characters. Now. One of my books is on big data, another one is kind of a companion book on data visualization. So I know what these terms mean. But if you put them together, it doesn't mean anything. True story, I was at a separate conference here in Las Vegas. Might have been CES back in January, I think it was. And I went up to the CSC booth. And I talked to him about 
big data platform as a service, BD Paz or whatever, I don't even know how you pronounce it. And this guy worked at CSC and he was so psyched that I heard about it. He said, yeah, let me tell you all about it. I said, stop, do you guys have any customers? He said, what do you mean by customer? I don't know people who give you money to use it. <laughs> well, it depends what you mean. And he starts equivocating, right? And finally he said, no, nobody uses it. Now, I don't know why, but I would be willing to bet that if people actually understood what they were buying, they might be more inclined to buy it. My first book, Why New Systems Fail, is about failed IT projects, two types basically. CRM, Customer Relationship Management, and ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, basically back office stuff, supply chain, financials, payroll. Those projects were plagued by a 60% failure rate. The projects either didn't do what they said they would do, took too long, uh, went over budget, or some combination of the above. If you're only batting 40% on things that you know that you're buying, what are the odds that you're gonna be successful when you have no idea? Here's another one. What movie is this from? Did you already win a book? Okay, cool hand, Luke. One of my favorites. What we've got here is failure to communicate. Fantastic movie if you haven't seen it. 1967, I can't believe that movie's almost 50 years old. Here is a company endorsement from Scott McNeely who co-founded Sun Microsystems. They don't define what WAS is. Turns out it's work as a service. Work is a service. Why is everything a service these days? I'm just waiting for service as a service. Everything's out of control with services. The right, does anyone know what this does? I, I don't. I was at a separate conference about two years ago and I went as a member of the media. I wasn't speaking. I'm not an employee of this company. And after about 45 minutes of listening to one of the top five people in the company throw out acronym after acronym, I raised my hand in front of 200 people and said, excuse me, can you tell me what ABC and XYZ mean? And I got probably 199 quizzical looks from people. And the woman says, yeah, these are the terms. Goes back to speaking. About two hours later, I'm online at lunch. And a few people start pointing at me and I think, here I am, I'm in trouble. And they come over to me and say, yeah, we were looking for you. You were the guy who asked that question earlier. And I said, yeah. But yeah, we didn't know what they were either. And I said, oh, are you with the media? Where, where do you write? Oh, no, no, we work for the company. <laughs> so the own comp employees of this company didn't understand what their senior leadership were talking about. But this isn't just executives, right? Marketing folks or management consultants. I'm going to go off on them in a bit. People who write and speak for a living sometimes are incredibly unclear in how they present their ideas. This comes from Brian Salas' book, The End of Business and As Usual, something about a next work. I think it was exactly this sentence I read on page 70, if I'm not mistaken, in which I closed the book and said, I'm done. I consider myself a reasonably bright guy. My professor wasn't assigning this for homework. This makes no sense to me. If I can explain big data at a high level to a teenager, why does this have to confuse me? I don't understand it. Anyone know this quote? It's a bit obscure. I love this one since I'm a, I'm a geek at heart. The real problem is not whether machines think, but whether men do. B.F. Skinner, the American psychologist. All right, so we've had jargon for a long time, right? That's nothing new. And in the book, Bless You, I go back to quotes from George Orwell in 1946 about the evolving use of language. Why is jargon so prevalent today? Right, what are the usual suspects? First up, management consultants. And I used to be one. There's this erroneous belief that management is a science. It's not. Management is a discipline. If anything, it's a social science. You can't tell me that there is a prescribed way of doing things. You might have recommendations, but there are way too many variables to control. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius with one atmospheric pressure, always. There are no other variables. If those conditions hold, then water always freezes, and it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. That's it. There is no management analog. You can tell two companies to do the same thing and one company could succeed and the other could fall flat on its face. That's not to diminish what management consultants do, but you understand why they like to use words like synergy and alignment and optics to make it appear as if what they're doing is really scientific. It's not. Has everyone heard of SEO, search engine optimization? Okay, if you haven't, I'll give you a 20 second description. There are two ways to get to the top at Google. A, buy your way up. Ads, right? This is how Google makes 98% of its revenue. So I could buy an ad for awesome public speakers, but that gets expensive. The better way to do it is organic. 
So if every one of you blogs and writes about what an incredible speaker I am, please do, Google picks up on that, and all of a sudden when people search for good speakers, there I am without paying a nickel. Does anyone know what percentage of clicks go to the number one result on Google on average? Come on, pick a number. 75. No. It's lower than 75. Who said 37? Give him a book. It's close enough. It's like card sharks. It is like card sharks. <laughs> so if you're number one on Google, you can expect to re retrieve about one in three clicks. Now it varies. And that number drops considerably. So number two isn't as good. Number three isn't as good. Note here the drop off between 10 and 11. If you're on the second page, you might as well in some cases be invisible. Now, if you're searching for Kim Kardashian, you could still get a lot of traffic if you're on page 57, because for some reason, everyone searches for Kim Kardashian. So there's tremendous pressure to occupy the top. And when you look at a memo or press release like CSC's Next Generation Big Data Platform as a Service, it makes no sense, but in a way I understand it. If you Google data platform as a service, at least a year ago when I was writing the book, CSC didn't come up. The company came up by the name of Cloudant. Cloudant just got acquired maybe a year ago by IBM. So that's, it's almost like that's dead. We can't be data platform as a service. We need to be big data platform as a service and a next generation one to boot. So I understand why these companies are trying to define their new terms. They don't want to be on that second page. Other reasons, for some reason, we feel like the bigger word makes us sound more important. I say nonsense. Uh, I had a piece run last week in Fast Company, and it was clearly edited because the word leverage was in there. I never use the word leverage. I always use the word use. Why? It's simple. It's shorter. And eventually, I will get to a polysyllabic word like polysyllabic. And if I'm using leverage, I'm kind of using up my syllables. And someone came up to me in Seattle after I spoke there a couple weeks ago and said, yeah, but my college professor told me, if at all possible, use the biggest words. I said, I want to strangle your college professor. There's nothing wrong with simplicity. Einstein says so. But we have this fear of it, right? It's almost as if, well, you can't fire me because I'm the only person that does da 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 It's almost like you don't want to make your job seem too simple. I don't think there's anything wrong with being able to clearly explain what you're doing. That's not to say that sometimes you don't have to get into the weeds. In the book, I tell the story of a time I was on a consulting project implementing a particular system, and the issue was so thorny that my counterpart and I had to go so far into the weeds that there's no way anyone on earth would have understood what we were talking about unless you had this understanding. But it wasn't jargon because we remembered our audience. We didn't suffer from what, what people call the curse of knowledge, right? We don't know that other people don't know what we know. This happened to me very recently when I spoke at an event. I asked the guy ahead of time if he wanted to see the galley of the book. Now, for those of you who don't know, the galley is just the PDF, the electronic file that becomes this. So he flat out said, what's a galley? It was an honest mistake, but we forget the curse of knowledge. Most authors know what a galley is. Most publishers know. I forgot that rule myself. So like I said, I'm not a perfect communicator. In many organizations, as I said, there's this culture of jargon, it's custom. People don't speak clearly or simply. There's just more stuff out there. They call it big data for a reason. One of my favorite stats going back to the fifth book um, I was researching it and read a book called The Human Face of Big Data by Rick Smolin and another person, I forget her name. Anyway, according to his research, the average person today is exposed to more information in a single day than somebody was in his or her entire lifetime in the 15th century. In 1972, the average person saw 500 marketing messages in a day. Does anyone know what that number is today? Take a guess. It's, it's more. 5,000. Um, give me a book. We see 10 times as many marketing messages today. Now, they may not be billboards or newspapers. What are those? They're probably on these things or different screens. So we're constantly being bombarded with, bombarded with information. And change happens faster than ever. There's a stat in the book from the 25th anniversary celebrating the web. It happened, I think, about a year ago. And there's this great research done by The Economist showing that the rates of adoption are intensifying. In other words, it took a long time for us to get our arms around radios and television, but less time 
around smartphones and the internet and PCs. So things are actually speeding up and we're oblivious to the effects of jargon, such as it erodes credibility and trust. In 2010, a couple of Swiss researchers looked at communication and found that people who spoke simpler and clearer were actually viewed as more credible, more trustworthy than people who used a bunch of legalese, business speak, or mumbo jumbo. The ironic part of the study, the authors called for, and I'm not making this up, greater linguistic concreteness. You need to be more linguistically concrete, okay? It confuses and overwhelms employees and customers. Remember that statistic before from Constant Contact. The same thing applies here. People are overwhelmed. They don't understand what they need to do. It causes delays and failed projects. Again, I've seen this many times in my career as a consultant. Now, sometimes people are using jargon intentionally because they don't want to be clear. Right? This question came up uh, last week in Texas. Right? Sometimes I would ask people flat out, I can do A or B, which is it? They didn't want to give me an answer. Why? Because if they told me very clearly that they wanted me to do A, and to boot it was an email, and it turned out to be the wrong option, then guess what? Not that I'm that kind of person, but there I've got documented proof that someone was wrong. And of course, we can't afford to do that. Okay, I've convinced you I'm going to take a few questions in a bit, but I can rail against communication all day long. What are some tips on how I can communicate better? Look for communication canaries in the coal mine. I recently um, did a book tour of Seattle and Texas, and I was looking for sponsors. And I reached out to companies I cite in the book that make collaborative software. And I reached out to one, I won't name it, but right on the website, and they just received a bunch of funding, there's a PR firm. So I email the PR person, I send her a link that has the book tour, kind of an FAQ, what I hope to do, when I'm going to do it, et cetera, et cetera. Go back and forth a few times, and after three, I invoke my three email rule. After three, we talk. The woman writes back, no time, even though I'd included my phone number and a link to my schedule, we have to do this over email. So I broke my own three email rule. I couldn't help be a little snarky and go, I hope you appreciate the irony here. <laughs> you represent a company that's trying to minimize email, yet you will only communicate me with me via email. I mentioned before the curse of knowledge. It's very easy for us to forget that other people don't know what we know. It's very natural. It happened to me very recently. Understand that. Not everyone does. I think it's important to clearly define your terms. I asked before if any of you had heard of SEO, and my hunch is that from what I understand of Zappos, most of you, at least at a high level, understand it. But let's say there's one person here who hadn't heard of it. I've just made it clear, I hope, to everyone in the room. And what did it take, 20 seconds? Simpler language, I like to save my syllables. I will always opt, if I can, for a simpler word over a more complex one, because eventually I will get to words that actually have multiple syllables. I also think that email conversations are essentially bogus. We lose a lot of the context, right? If a band that's been together for 30 years can misunderstand itself, communicating via email, I think the same thing can happen in companies large and small. And then finally, remember that the word communicate means to make common. Are you making something common? Good question to ask. This is not my tag, but I just love ending talks with it. Here's how you get in touch with me. And I think we have time for a few questions. I know that Kim has a microphone. Yes. Um, so I talk louder. Um, OK. So For those of you in here, um, emails often kind of conflict with what I'm saying, right? I have to send email because I've got five minutes in between meetings. Right? I could go off on a separate rant on the meaning of many meetings. Uh, I think there's a book, Death by Meeting, worth reading. I think that, and I'm not the first person to say this, many meetings ought to be held with people standing up because then they're going to get to their point. I mean, I think communication in, in general is broken. I focus mostly on jargon and on how we use too much email. But it's kind of like if you're in too many meetings and you send too many emails, then if you golf and you've got a bad swing and you correct it with a bad grip, they say in golf, never play someone with a bad swing and a bad grip because that person's probably figured it out. So it's almost like two wrongs make a right. 
Um, is there something deeper going on? Should we rely on email because we're afraid that everything has to be done? I think there's a time and a place. I think that some meetings are incredibly important and interesting, the way that some emails are actually useful. When I get the video from this event, I'm not gonna have Kim call me up and read me the name of the file. No, she can send me an email. But I, I think that in general, corporate communication is broken. And if we're wasting a lot of time in meetings and because of that we send a lot of email, then I think that we have to look at meetings as well. Why, why are they sacrosanct? Why does everything need to be done? Most meetings, are, I would argue that many meetings are analogous to many emails with people unnecessarily copied. Do they really need to be there? I've been in meetings for an hour and a half when my only talk was for 10 minutes of it. And there's a point in the book in which we used um, on a consulting project in 2004. And this was before collaboration tools have gotten to the point at which they are today. And we sat down from, it was either 7.30, I think it was around 6 to around 10, 10.30 at night. And everyone on the project had to just sit there reading what they needed to do. And it was the project manager typed everything into a Microsoft project file. Now, that wasn't a good use of our time, but we had no choice back then. Um, I remember that around 9 o'clock thinking to myself, red wine never tasted so good. And this poor guy from Poland had to sit there the whole time and didn't say anything. And he was so hammered at the end. So I, I don't think that emails... Um, emails, it's, it's a cultural thing to me. I, I can demonize e email all day long, but that doesn't mean that we should spend more time in unnecessary meetings. Other questions? Yes? Yes, for those who didn't hear, do I detail in the book any tips for shifting communication patterns? Yes, there's an entire chapter, but it's not a set of rules. I break my own three email rule all the time. Um, I think it's important to set up your own rules. There's no big chart. If you're emailing about an IT project and 12 people are copied and one's a vice president and it's been four emails, then, right, that's just impossible. Um, I like to think that my books in general are about ideas and trends more than about specific uh, technologies or features. Otherwise, my books would become dated pretty quickly. Um, I want people to think about sending that email or, or having that meeting. I want people to question why people are using jargon. I want more people to stand up and say, can you say that in English, please? There's a great story, because um, I come from a consulting background, I heard a couple years ago about how the CEO of a company was about to embark on a multi-million dollar project with consultants. And he told people flat out, the language on this project is English. And he held people through it, to it. And he called bullshit when it was, I think, appropriate. So that gets, it's easy for me to say, as an independent writer and speaker, and I try not to irritate people, but I'll bet you a Coke that if you don't understand something, like when I raised my hand at that conference and two people pointed me out, other people don't understand it either. So I want people to think there are absolutely better tools and there's an entire table in the book that lists some of them and you're probably using some as well. But it isn't just about tools because you can make the most collaborative tools in the world completely ineffectual because you are putting every thought down there and responding and it's not email, but it's basically email. So I think it's important to question what you're doing and why. And in, I, I conclude the book with basically a choice, right? You can ignore all of the advice that I'm giving and send 150 emails a day and listen to jargon and it just doesn't bother you and that's fine. You could say, you know what? I'm getting out of here. I just, I can't deal with it. I want my vacation time for myself. Americans don't take half of their allotted vacation time and many who do or just posting something on Instagram or Facebook, and now let me just check email so I don't get home and have a thousand emails waiting for me. Or you can fight the good fight and lead. So those are the three options as I see it. Got time for one, two more questions? Yes. No, I completely agree with that. That story I met, for those of you who didn't hear the question, um, what about smaller groups and they have the same level of knowledge? No, why is it jargon if everyone understands? In the book I tell the story, of, it's, a, it's a, um, a fake story, but if two doctors are operating on someone in a, in a very fast way, right, emergency procedure, and they're talking about intubation and all these terms and you don't understand them, well guess what? You don't at that point need to understand them. In fact, if the doctors were to slow down and explain it to you, then the patient could wind up dying. 
So it's not jargon if other people really understand it, but I question, to, to your point, if many people actually understand a lot of these terms, right? When I listen to these startups, one of my, my, my best-selling book to this point is called The Age of the Platform. I don't even use the word platform anymore because it irritates me because everything's a platform these days, right? And when I hear about companies that were a platform for selling bagels, I go, what? It just doesn't make any sense to me. So I don't think that it's jargon in a specified format because you get to a certain point if you're dealing with solving a technical problem or a medical issue in which everyone understands what you're saying and you understand them. In other words, you're communicating, you're making things common. If you're just bloviating to a bunch of people and saying nothing like some of the examples I used, um, is that really specialized knowledge that couldn't be made a lot simpler? Uh, I'd argue it could be.